to the second month of our Peace and Justice Studies virtual conference and uh, to our keynote address for the month of October. The theme this month is storytelling and narrative in peace studies. Um, I'm happy, very happy to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Philip Metz of John Carroll University, um, whose title is Shrapnel Maps, Story Seeking Peace and Justice in Israel, Palestine. Phil is going to read some poetry, um, tell some stories, make some remarks, um, reflect on peace, justice, and the transformational work of the moral imagination. He is a professor of English at John Carroll University, the author of 10 books, 10 books of poetry, um, 10 books, and Shrapnel Maps was recently reviewed or described as beautiful, half dream, half nightmare, all real, filled with the remnants of what people hope for and what they are willing to do and everything that remains afterwards. It's a confrontation to identity and it dares to conjugate love as a defiance to the capacity of violence. Extraordinary, elegant and devastating and compelling and complex. So Phil's gonna talk for about half an hour, 40 minutes, and then we'll entertain questions. I ask that people send questions to me via the chat. Um, and when we get to the Q&A, we'll go back to gallery view so we can kind of see everybody and the questions as, they, as their questions are being answered. And with that, I will turn it over to our speaker. Thanks so much, Michelle. I'm really happy to be joining you tonight from University Heights, Ohio. Thanks to all the organizers of the Peace and Justice Studies Association to, um, to have me here and to, for all of you who've come to listen and will hear or listen sometime in the near future. Um, so the title of my talk relates to this book that I wrote, Shrapnel Maps, which came out earlier this year in April amidst the pandemic. Um, for me, it's more than a book. It's really a journey and an invitation into a conversation. I believe we need to have this conversation about what's happening not only here at home and understanding systems of oppression and violence that are happening right here, but also the, uh, systems that we're connected to that oppress uh, abroad. Um, in particular, this book is really dealing with the Israel and Palestine uh, dynamic predicament Conflict seems like maybe too neutral a term, but we need to find ways of um, finding accountability, constructive engagement, and of course, nonviolent means of persuasion and transformation. I just wanna say a little bit about myself before I get started. I am a professor and a writer. Uh, my main mode of telling stories is through poems, and I will share a number of poems with you tonight. I live in University Heights, Ohio, which is just outside of Cleveland. My neighborhood is predominantly a modern Jewish Orthodox neighborhood, although I'm not modern Jewish Orthodox, I'm Catholic uh, by background. And um, we chose this neighborhood because it was within walking distance of my university, a Catholic university just down the street. It's been so remarkable and fascinating to be living among this community, which is incredibly vibrant and has many diverse uh, modes of um, expression of faith. And um, there have also been some really uh, difficult experiences navigating otherness and difference. So in some strange way, myself as an Arab American and a Christian living in a Jewish community here outside of Cleveland, I have found myself living in sort of parables of, um, of neighborliness. And um, so, so the first poem is actually gonna sort of refer to this kind of predicament and dynamic. It is called Family. And I'm gonna show it on the screen just in case it makes it a little bit easier for you to follow. But I will try to, do my best in um, sharing the voices as I hear them. 
this basically happened a couple of years ago. There's very little that I changed. Family. At the Catholic University, a speaker clicks through slide after slide of barbed wire, cattle shoot checkpoints, and walls. His mantra? Occupation. What threatens the Christians, he concludes, is what threatens Palestinians. A woman stands up. I wanted to let everyone know, she says, that this talk was full of spin. I can't see her. She's behind me. I'm afraid to look back. The truth is the opposite. My heart goes out to her, standing in the heart of another country. The reason for the wall was that people were being attacked, she says, by terrorists. After all, the Arabs sold the land. It was too much trouble. I shrink back in my seat. And at a Catholic school, you should know what the church has done, especially during World War II. Then a man gets up. I can't see him. He's behind me. I'm afraid to look back. The Jews bought a tiny bit of land, but the rest, the rest was stolen. My heart goes out to him, standing in the heart of another country. But, he says, they did not buy everything, even if they buy Congress. I shrink again. She says, you have 14 Arab countries. Can't we just have one? They should take you in. He says, but this is our land. Why should we have to leave? Because Europe took it from us? That is why we fight. What about peace? Someone mumbles. He says, how can you negotiate over a pizza when one side continues to eat? She says, how can you negotiate over a pizza when one side's trying to stab you with knives? It goes on like this for a long time, years, decades, generations. I sit like a child at the table, watch parents grip utensils, spit words like shrapnel. I hate how I love them. Ashamed, I look down, unable to bury the hot metal. So friends, you might feel like one of these characters. I wrote it because it encapsulates something of the predicament of those who work for peace and justice um, and the ways in which we might be feeling this deep traumatic sense that people bring to this conflict, whether from the Jewish community whose experience of anti-Semitism over so many years has created a sense of hypervigilance about and protectiveness for the state of Israel, which for many Jews who have a Zionist um, and a nationalist perspective um, want to protect this state and their, um, this, this dream of, of their own country. At the same time, you might also know the trauma of Palestinians who experienced the Nakba in 1948 when 750,000 Palestinians were dispossessed, uh, threatened, and um, driven from their home and country and became refugees in various parts of the Middle East and even in, in the United States. When I listened to both of those speakers that night, um, in addition to the main speaker, um, I felt a sense of real sadness and interestingly, great discomfort with my inability to know precisely what to say. That feeling is often shared by those who are interested in peace and justice, who want to enter into the, the, the story of Israel and Palestine. We want to show our solidarity with Jews who've experienced so much uh, oppression and persecution, and we wanna show our solidarity with Palestinians who have had their uh, rights um, so disregarded and who've been erased and who've been um, also sort of not seen and so, um, so damaged by this conflict. So what I wish that I had done was basically stood up and welcomed them into our space, even though they would not disagree would not agree and, and probably could not have come to an agreement that those voices and those stories would have been welcome in that space and certainly those people would have been welcome in that space and i wish that we could have continued the conversation afterward obviously i could say a lot more about this conflict and one thing that is really difficult about writing a book about or teaching about the israel and palestine conflict is 
not only that um, we have two populations who have been uh, who've experienced great violence and great have a great sense of trauma in their stories, um, but also the fact that uh, it, one sh probably should not teach them as sort of uh, equal partners in a conflict. I mean, for anybody who's studied the conflict, you understand that um, the state of Israel has an enormous army and an enormous power about it, and Palestinians are a stateless people who are um, who don't have much power and much legitimacy on the world stage, um, despite the fact that there have been times that the UN has sort of made de declarations in the General Assembly in support of Palestinians, they st in, in some sort of like real politics sense, Palestinians have almost almost no power. Um, so it's very difficult to teach a course or to write a book in which we acknowledge and create space for these different stories at the same time that we also acknowledge the great asymmetry and power that exists in the conflict. Now, just a little bit more about myself. I grew up in a loving home. Uh, my father was a proud Lebanese American, Arab American. My mother was and uh, she was also a, a Vietnam veteran. My mother was a, f a former or attempted nun, which didn't, didn't hold, and a uh, very American, Irish, German background. I didn't know much about uh, the Middle East growing up, just that we were to be proud of Lebanon and, and proud of our heritage. Um, but everything changed in the early 1990s when my sister, who was an intrepid and, and truly courageous person, decided that she wanted really to learn Arabic. And to do that, um, she, she went to Birzeit University in the West Bank, uh, the Palestinian West Bank. Um, and so for two straight summers, she had this immersive experience, not only in language, but also the culture and stories of Palestinians. When she came back, the stories she told me shocked me to the core. And to be honest, I did not believe them. I did not believe them. When she said that, uh, you know, early on, you know, she was walking in a, a, a town, I think probably it was in Ramallah, and um, a man came sort of driving through in an erratic way and shooting a pistol out at the window. Um, when she talked about the widespread torture of Palestinians that had been happening in Israeli jails, the ongoing detention of Palestinians who were resisting the terms of their, um, uh, their oppression. And uh, so I thought she'd been brainwashed. And we had many, many frank conversations over that time. That experience that she had, and knowing that you know, she was coming to this with, um, with her sincerity and her witness, that I wanted to learn more. And everywhere I went since that time, I'd been tr I tried to meet Palestinians, and I, I did news stories about them. I. I read the, the poetry and the stories of Palestinians to try to recalibrate my sense of what was happening and what I might do about it. 10 years after her experience, she uh, was contacted by a man that she had been dating when she was there who wasn't able to come visit her for um, reasons that were not entirely clear. Um, after a whirlwind, whirlwind romance, they actually decided to get married. And so in 2003, we, um, we went to this little village where he was from, Tura in the West Bank. And what I saw there was so magical and really opened my eyes to the ways in which Palestinians, despite our best efforts, um, continue to be dehumanized, not only when they're erased and called terrorists, but also um, when they're depicted simply as victims and not as people with a vibrant culture and life. Um, that's, that experience was deeply profound. And I'd like to maybe share some poems and some pictures from that experience. So I am going to share my screen again. Okay. 
Sorry, did I just mute myself? Sorry. <laughs> well, this is the book. <clears throat> this is my neighborhood. Uh, very recently, um, my neighbors celebrated Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, They're going off to the synagogue in their white garb. So here's my sister in 2003. I'll just say a word about this picture. I mean, the first night of a wedding ceremony in Palestine is the night of the women's celebration. And for reasons I can't quite understand, uh, they, they were okay with me taking pictures. And I, seeing that the happy faces of the women of the village and the support and celebration that they brought to that experience um, was so beautiful that I, I, I can't even sort of bring words to it, but I will read a couple poems that are sort of about this. I wrote a long poem, basically a wedding poem for my sister, years after the event, because it was just something about it that I could never forget. So that long poem is called A Concordance of Leaves. And there's a couple things that, um, photos that I'll need to share with you. One is, so there's me, a much younger me in the middle with some of my family and some of Majid's family. Um, I wanted to share with you this image of this young boy whose father had um, been in prison um, for years and years. The sadness on his face is something I just wanted to connect up to something that happens in this first poem. Okay. Scarved sisters are radiant with wide mouths and waves and teeth and singing. And though, is, though there is the great unhappiness framed in silent, unsmiling faces hammered on the insides of houses, night is lifting, the women are drumming the tabla, their voices inviting a heart to break itself and open a space another could nest inside. Because there is a word for love in this tongue that entwines two people as one. And there is a word for love in this tongue that nests in the chambers of the heart. And a word for love in this tongue that wanders the earth. For love in this tongue in which you lose yourself in this tongue. And a word that carries sorrow within its vowels. And a word for love that exudes from your pores. And a word for love that shares its name with falling. Um, I could obviously say more about these images, but I wanted just to share them with you to give you a sense of the lived experience of Palestinians in this village who, who've been there for generations. And uh, property is expropriated for things like this wall that was built ostensibly to protect the state of Israel and its citizens, but was built on a line that was actually inside the 67 Green Line. Um, so when I came back from that trip, I was very much interested in kind of not only learning more, but seeing if I could bring these stories into the classroom, these experiences into the classroom. Um, I'd never had a gun pointed at me and I was there. I never had to lie about why I was entering a country. I had never had to, um, you know, to take my camera and hide it when, uh, you know, going through a checkpoint. These experiences were just a little taste of the bitterness of life under military occupation that Palestinians have experienced. And though there may be reasons for this, the heightened kind of security apparatus um, that Israel's constructed to protect its citizens, there are ways in which uh, it, it exists in its own logical system of pressure and dehumanization. So in deciding to teach a course on this subject, one of the things I wanted to do was to make sure that I accounted for both Israeli and Palestinian stories and narratives. And that was very important for me um, 
for a few different reasons. One is because I understand anti-Semitism continues to be a kind of virus, a plague in, in thinking, and to inoculate um, my students into understanding the, the, the poison of that, at the same time as introducing them to the kind of the colonial dimension of Palestinian life um, and the predicament of Palestinians. So to understand why Israelis feel the way they do and what stories they hold about what's happening there, set alongside and in, and in, and in dialogue with um, Palestinian stories about what is happening to them and why they think it's happening and what they want to do about it. Some years later, I discovered this wonderful book, which is the slide I'm showing right now, called The Moral Imagination, The Art and Soul of uh, Building Peace by John Paul Lederach, who is obviously one of the great, great thinkers in, of peace building in our field, uh, trained as a sociologist, but uh, um, a long time uh, sort of mediator, uh, facilitator of discussions between people in conflict and, and peoples in conflict. He wrote this book after many, many years of working as a mediator. Um, and what was so beautiful about it to me as, as a writer and as someone who's really passionate about stories is he says that, you know, we can teach people the skills of dialogue and listening and, and negotiation, but there's also these capacities or skills that have a kind of art to them. And the, these things, I would argue, are things that we see enacted in uh, storytelling, in narratives and poems and films. So the study of the narratives and films and stories of people in conflict can be a way not only of understanding the conflict, but also the ways in which the conflict um, is not the only story, that there's something outside of conflict. So for Lederach, the moral imagination is the capacity to imagine something rooted in the challenges of the real world, yet capable of giving birth to something that does not yet exist. What I love about that is some of us, you know, either get caught in the total realpolitik world, that is to say, what, what is, you know, realism, what is the way, you know, the power dimensions of conflict and, 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 and others of us get caught in images of or elevating heroic people, peace people, but have a hard time sort of bringing those two elements together. I believe Lederach sort of brings that down to a really, really basic and helpful um, kind of set of capacities and disciplines. And I call them the four C's, and I did this for my students so they understand these kind of four elements. There are certainly more elements that one could bring to this, not only this, um, the work of peace, but also the peace of justice. But the first he talks about is, and he says it in a very interesting way. I, t I say it, I talk about it as compassion or empathy for the other. He calls it the capacity to imagine ourselves in a web of relationships that includes our enemies. The ability to sustain a paradoxical curiosity, sorry, that's it. To imagine ourselves in a web of relationships that includes our enemies. That doesn't mean he's saying you have to feel sorry for uh, the perpetrator, or you have to totally empathize with someone you don't empathize with. What he says something is, is, is more subtle than that. He says, you are in a relationship, a web of relationships that even includes your enemy. What do we do about that? Second is curiosity. He says, the ability to sustain a paradoxical curiosity that embraces complexity without reliance on dualistic polarity. So this curiosity embraces the fact that the world is more complicated than an us-them binary, a good evil binary. There's more going on that we need to understand. And that curiosity is a capacity that will enable us to not only sort of have this thing called immoral imagination, but really sort of be able to move beyond uh, conflict or imagine a place beyond um, violent conflict. I think conflict is always going to exist between people who have different stories and different realities. But if that conflict can be 
managed, if that conflict can be transformed, if that conflict can, uh, can you know, re refuse to, to enter into sort of absolute violence, then, then we've made progress as human beings. The third thing he talks about is the, um, the fundamental belief in and the faith in the creativity, the creative act. And last, um, the courage to risk, the acceptance of the inherent risk of stepping into the mystery of the unknown that lies beyond the far too familiar landscape of violence. So compassion, curiosity, creativity, and the courage to risk. So my course really brought students into an understanding of the complexity of each people's narrative and narratives. It enabled them to have a certain kind of compassion for and an imagination for the lived experience of people finding themselves in this predicament. It created situations where characters and us as readers would have to figure out not only why the, the stories were ending as they often do in tragedy um, and whether there's any way out of that. And the last, can we find moments, glimmers of hope when we see characters refuse the sort of, um, refuse the, the choices that seem like their only choice when they take a, when they show um, their compassion or when they, sh they make a creative act which sort of goes against everything that, um, that the story has sort of set us up for. So John Paul Lederach kind of gave me a way of not only talking about these works, but also having students sort of look for and develop their own capacities in these areas. Um, so I'm gonna stop share it just for a second here. And bring up another couple of poems. So going back to my neighborhood, um, I wanted to share another poem. Actually, I'm going to go to uh, s s a poem sort of late in this. It's called The Daily Contortions. So we just hit Yom Kippur. So this is sort of one of the th painful things that happened in my family was that my daughter had a, um, a friend that she, a number of Jewish friends who, with whom she'd play, but the one sort of ac across the street um, who's named here Yael, um, her mother did not want her to play with my daughter and wouldn't let her in her, the house. And uh, she was from a, a really self-protective uh, family. And this caused a, a, a lot of pain to my daughter, Adele, who didn't really understand why she was being excluded as children don't understand that sort of thing. And I could have said, well, it has to do with you know, kosher laws and, and um, that sort of thing, but it, it wouldn't have made any uh, sense to her as a, you know, as a six-year-old. So this poem is about a kind of negotiation that happened that I was, uh, that I was witness to between these girls in the neighborhood. I mostly kept quiet because um, I was just interested in seeing how they dealt with their own conflict. The Daily Contortions. He's rushing down the block, away from shul, dressed in black hat, black coat and pants, black socks, peeking beneath lemon yellow Crocs. Yom Kippur, my daughter's eight-year-old friend Rahel informs us. You can't wear leather, you don't eat, you get the chance to become an angel. The kids are gathered around Yael's swing, whose arc's so wide, you wonder if you're flying. The only grown-up I give underdogs, which means helping others to wing, as Layla says, still lacking letters. Yael, our neighbor, the spit and image of my daughter, refuses her pretzels. I don't give non-Jews pretzels, she explains then, but I can give them to my dog. But Adele's almost Jewish, Rahel insists. Aren't you, Adele? Who among us does not want pretziola, little rewards the monks would grant to children, reciting Bible verses, which read wrongly one day would darken into Kristallnacht. The little arms folded in prayer, a crucifixion treat to savor and swallow. Here the daily contortions continue. Who can do what? 
and who cannot, and by what law is it possible, and to sate which God hungry for our obedience. I want to shake the little angel, her flaming words expelling my daughter from the garden of her sunburned yard. I don't know what to say, but like in the dream when a door opens to another room where hell turns and breaks her pretzel, handing the savory splinter to Adele. One of the things that I also wanted to do with this book was to show that I understood why my Jewish neighbors and Jewish friends felt such a strong and even fierce self-protectiveness when it came to the state of Israel. And one man that uh, was interviewed for my class, Jerry Isaac Shapiro, was a headmaster of a local Jewish school, um, shared the, an anecdote which I wanted to sort of capture for this book that to me kind of explained this protectiveness and this longing for this place. And I wanted that to be part of this book, even though in a lot of ways, um, I wanted to center Palestinian experience. Our Quiet Saturdays for Jerry Isaac Shapiro. You know, Richard Pryor, the black comedian, used the N-word until he went to Nairobi. Seeing black people in charge of the country from the wino to the president changed him. Damn, I thought he's talking about Zionism because that's how American Jews feel like him, walking in wonder on the streets in Israel, our quiet Saturdays. At last we have a home. Anti-Semitism, intermarriage, my friends tell me I'm crazed, always worrying. Easy for them. When there are 60 million Jews in this country, then we won't worry about every single family. So that poem kind of articulates a little bit of, um, I think the, the, to the protectiveness that Jews often feel, even about conversations about Israel, not just even about Israel itself. I'd like to maybe just read a couple more poems to conclude um, and to share that one of the things that I thought was really essential to do in a book like this is to share the stories of activists who have t make, made incredible, courageous decisions in committing themselves to protecting the, the rights of people who've been trampled. And one of them is Rabbi Ark Osherman, who's um, one of the co-founders of Rabbis for Human Rights. And this is an image of him being dragged away after a nonviolent demonstration, trying to protect a Palestinian home from being demolished in Area C, which is um, a part of the West Bank, the Palestinian West Bank that Israel often um, closes for various reasons or, or, you know, doesn't allow Palestinians to build. So this is a poem that basically is taken from his own stories, according to this Midrash. The Midrash says, when Hagar and Ishmael are banished into the desert, before God builds a well, the angels cry, what are you doing? Don't you know the stories the Jewish people are going to suffer at the hands of the children of Ishmael? And God, according to this Midrash, says, right now, in front of me, there's a child. Right now, this child is innocent. Look, I know some Palestinians would want to kill me and my children. I know some Israelis do not see Palestinians as human and use the law to keep us separate. But when I visit Palestinians, they waken their children to meet us in caves where they live after their house was demolished. We sit on packed suitcases as they serve me tea. Their son who'd been tied to a windshield by the army and the man in the kippah who'd come to his aid. A couple months ago, I was actually on a political call with a representative and aide to, um, to my Senator in Ohio, one of, one of the senators, Robert Portman, and I got a chance to talk with him and to thank him for his work and to hear him advocate for 
um, a family in Silwan, a village or a, a neighborhood in Jerusalem, that uh, who was they were going to lose their house um, from the state, sort of taking it over. The next poem I'd like to share is um, for Huweda Araf, who was one of the founders of the International Solidarity Movement. Um, she did this incredibly courageous act, which I think I will show, show you as I read the poem. Let's see if I can really uh, up my technology game here. Let's see if it works. Um, it's gonna take me a second just to make sure I can figure this out, hold on. Click, 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 click. This is Huweda Araf at a nonviolent demonstration in the West Bank as Israeli soldiers are um, shooting at the demonstrations. These would have been um, sort of uh, these protests that were happening to stop the wall from being built. Um, I'll turn the volume down so you can just see her in confronting the soldiers. The dance of the activist and the typist. She inserts the inked ribbon of herself between the black roller of history and the alphabetic metal legs of that inverted insect. Rifles thrash the air, the targets scatter. She can't help it. Something in her grows each time she turns to face the rifle, grows as she covers its permanent erection. The typist lifts his wrists and legs hover to stamp. Where the rifle moves, she moves. A mirror following the lead of inevitable lead. She's the rifle, unfired, shield of flesh, her arms overhead, before the muzzle, as if she could cradle a bullet. I'd like to share maybe two more poems and then open it up for questions. One of the things that I wanted to do as well in the book is to sort of reconstruct the memories of people who have lost their villages and homes. And um, one of my dear friends, a man named Fatty Judah, is a, an amazing poet and translator of people like Mahmoud Darwish. Um, when I got to know him, I, I saw that his email had the, the word ease dude in it. And I didn't know what ease dude was, I-S-D-O-U-D. -D. Uh, so I said, what's ease dude? He said, that's the village that my family came from. And I said, uh, oh, I'm, so, I'm just so sorry that I, I, did, I didn't know. I just didn't know. And that set me into trying to understand what had happened to his family. Um, I'd like to share a picture of his dude that a refugee from 1948 um, had the opportunity just to go visit the last remains of that village. His dude for Fatty Judah. Dear descendant of the disappeared, you ascend the pillar of your own heir spin and span whole abysses with lines translating there to here and here to where wind winds in dry waddies, hoist sea in handful after invisible handful. He is due to now your email address and digital image of branches through windows within school ruins. A refugee points with his cane to what he only can see. You argue against the argument against yourself, you yourself make. And home in. Kiss my blind eyes clear, close keyholes with opening. Homeland, you cradle in vowels, what was not never yours. I'll hold it here till you return.
there's no way that I can share with you the totality of this kind of long book, but I hope that you get sort of a flavor or sense of the kinds of work that the book is doing. Um, I'd like to end with kind of a, a work called Future Interior, the end of a work called Future Interior, which is somewhat long, which I can't share the entirety of with you. But it's really an attempt to kind of think about the ongoing predicament of Palestinians. I mean, just recently we saw that Israel was planning to formally annex a huge swath of the West Bank. And although that, that did not happen for Palestinians, um, annexation, that is to say, the sort of gradual takeover of territory has been happening since uh, 1967 or even 1948. And uh, Palestinians and Israelis live in two completely different worlds. And this poem is trying to sort of explore the kind of systemic separation and uh, the separate worlds that they live in. So I'll just read the first poem and maybe a couple more. What is a settlement? So this language is taken from Jeff Halper's, uh, you know, a video that Jeff Halper did, who's one of the sort of most interesting to me, um, Israeli Jewish activists working on um, sort of documenting Palestinian, the, the loss of Palestinian rights. So what is a settlement? Here, here's another olive tree. As the walls rise, these trees, which have been in families for centuries, are taken, uprooted, then replanted in settlements, in fashion among the nouveau riche. Here is a shopping center, Ace Hardware, Burger Ranch, another ancient olive tree. This is the Library of Peace. This is the Music Conservatory. Look at the water flowing from this fountain. What is a ruin? When Isa was sentenced and buried in parentheses and his mother saw her house slowly becoming debris, she slid into a comma. She was driven by ambulance, dashes to ashes, pupils to colons, the new revised standard replacing the old revised standard, replacing the King's version and so on. Outside the house, not yet not house, a nightingale offered quotation marks around the bulldozers, boring exclamations of instant ancient ruins. Footnote to a lengthy dissertation on subject-object relations. Who, what knows no walls? 85% of West Bank water is funneled into the settlements or into Israel. That's why you always see water tanks on Palestinian roofs to say nothing about Gaza. Eight, what knows no walls? The lower the bullet hole in the water tank, the less the family can drink. What is a settlement again? When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. What is a settlement again? Before the wall, a village sidled up to the wadi, as if in love with the wadi, people streaming from dream into olive trees, rising before the light, before the bulldozers, before the red roof buildings rose atop the neighboring hill before the hill grew barbed wire perimeters, before the cell tower lifted itself, before the trailers encircled to protect it, before there was a man driving the road who lost his signal and reported it to the cell phone provider, who to comply with the law and serve the customers to ensure consistent service, thus fulfilling the divine plan of total cellular connectivity, before the nations that come and go like seasons, there was an olive sapling pulling itself by its own internal music composed of breakable earth, occasional rains, the rhythmic shifts of dark and light. What is the origin of map? Carta is Latin for paper. 
Everything written will have been a map for the future interior. What do people share? At midday in summer, the sun hammers you flat as tin. You look for any shadow to hide in. What do you want others to know? Tell them that we exist, that we exist even between the words of their text. What knows no state, no nation? From a certain height in a certain light, stretching across a plain, the land resembles warm skin. If you live long enough, you can almost see it, breathing. Thank you so much for listening and I apologize for going over, but I hope that you got something out of that. Phil, um, and don't apologize. Um, I read some of the poetry ahead of time, since you so kindly um, provided it. Um, and it was really, family was one of my favorites, by the way. Mm -hmm. So I'm really happy that you read that. And we have a question. So, Wendy wants to know, Philip, you said that you wanted to write poems to indicate to Jewish neighbors that you had some understanding of Jewish attachment to land. What has been the Jewish American response to your poems? That's a wonderful question. It has been mixed, <laughs> as has the Palestinian <laughs> response to my poems. Um, so one of my colleagues is, uh, um, she said, you know, I, I read the book and, um, you know, there was some of it I liked and some of it sort of made me so uh, upset that I, I can't yet put it into words. Another person said, you know, when you said in an interview that you wanted to create a space where Palestinians and Israelis and Arabs and Jews could um, sort of abide with each other and in, in each other's stories that she held her breath and that she'd been wanting to hear that her whole life. And she was so happy that you know, that this was happening. And I think that both of those responses I anticipated and welcome. Um, and the same for Palestinians, uh, who, some of whom feel very seen by the work. I had uh, Mossad Abu Toha, who's a, a Palestinian from Gaza, who's now just in his first year being over in the States. And he, he read my poem about Gaza and he said, I said, I hope this kind of speaks to your experience. He said, after commenting on the poem, he said, you are a Gazan. And I thought, well, if he can say that, that he felt that he felt seen by the poem, then, then it, it did some work. Other Palestinians, um, I, I read a review literally last night that said something like, um, maybe, the, maybe the book isn't for me. And maybe it's written for someone else. Um, I think that for some people, th this stuff is so profoundly upsetting that it's, it's hard to deal with. But I was trying to think, as I was writing, of a reader who would have had family who died in the Holocaust and a reader uh, who would have had uh, become refugees in 1948 as Palestinians. And um, just to keep myself honest about um, the care with which I wanted to share these stories and these experiences. So. Other questions, just type them in the chat. Otherwise, I'm going to monopolize Phil. And just keep Phil's not going to know what he's doing. Another question. Thanks, Philip. This was a great reading. I think you touched on this, but how did you personally navigate the varying conflicting views and lived experience knowing that you would be representing these in your work. How did I navigate these different experiences knowing that I would be like responsible for those representations? Is that what you said? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, we have a lot of rain in the background, so it's so ah. hard sometimes. Um, well, I spent years writing a book and I read you know, dozens and dozens of books and had many, many conversations with people. So I didn't go into it sort of um, without a sense of the veracity of, 
of the representations that, that I wanted to bring on, onto the page and the voices. There was a lot of work that ended up not going in the book. Um, so each section had a kind of internal logic or reason for being in the book. Like um, obviously my personal experience, both in my community here and also my experience at my sister's wedding and a third experience with a Palestinian refugee who would come to my classes. Um, those were experiences that I could rely deeply on my own lived experience and my own witnessing experience. But for the other sections, one of which is about a fictionalized suicide bombing, another of which is about Gaza, um, I really had to do a lot of research and I had to be really attentive to um, trying to avoid the traps of activist writing, which, for example, um, you know, heroizing or, or victimizing, you know, or um, making cartoons of the other side, you know, wh whoever the other side would have been in a certain moment, and to really try to um, be in proximity with these predicaments and these experiences. So I did a lot of research. I did a lot of conversations with people and uh, some of my own imag imagining and, you know, yeah, I hope that answers the question. But it's one that, um, it's at the heart of, the, so when I read a review, I always read a review like this because I, I'm afraid, you know, I'm afraid that um, either my intentions will be misunderstood or uh, that someone will have been hurt by what I've written because representation, it can be a violence as, uh, as, as we know, particularly representing uh, experiences of uh, people who've already been done such violence, ep epistemic violence, as well as actual violence. So um, I have another question from Ellen, who wonders if you are able to discuss these issues with any of your Jewish neighbors. Mm. <laughs> That's a really good question. You know, one of the poems in the book is actually about going around and canvassing for John Kerry back in uh, 2004. And uh, um, one of the, the weird things about it was I knew that I know that Israel for many of my neighbors is one of their most important political issues. And uh, so I had to try to make the argument which I think is doable that that uh, Kerry's policies would have been pro-Israel, but I felt like a real traitor to Palestinians doing it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a lot of political discussions with my neighbors, um, but I do try to, you know. Actually, I want to I want to say something about that, like. You know, I have Jewish colleagues and uh, Jewish uh, friends with whom I actively am having real conversations about this. But my immediate neighbors, our realities are mostly like, can I do a mitzvah for somebody? Or, you know, we, we have to do some work in the house or whatever. It's not about those, because I, I don't believe I'm gonna convince someone um, who, uh, I don't believe that one one should go around trying to convince people of uh, you know of views that, that they may never be convinced by. Um, but that being said, uh, I am trying to actively engage with and um, and in fact, I've created a little circle of poets, two Jewish poets. Uh, one is living in Israel in Haifa, the others uh, the daughter of. Um, an Israeli and, and uh, someone who was born in the camps actually in, in uh, Germany. And uh, two Palestinians, uh, Naomi Shihab and I, some of you may know, and this Mossad who I mentioned. And we are having conversations about this stuff and how um, it's so amazing. So, you know, so many of my progressive Jewish friends feel such pain about the fact of um, 
you know, knowing that Israel is not the country that they, that their parents had sort of talked about and dreamed about, mm -hmm. that it's become a right wing country in so many ways. And, um, and at the same time, feeling like the difficulty of um, kind of stating uh, publicly an alternative position on it. And I, I totally understand that, that predicament. Um, but the, one of the reasons why I wanted to have these conversations is because I think that um, Jews have always been in the for, forefront of social change and social movements. And um, I think that they are potentially Palestinians best allies. And I think that at the minimum, and this is not stuff that I teach in my classes, but at the minimum, um, and I, I say that because I'm, you know, I, I try to keep a pretty strong boundary between political advocacy <laughs> and education, but um, really trying to figure out ways to um, make our political system hold uh, all parties, but particularly Israel accountable for its actions since we give $3 billion of aid every year to the state, um, just to have some, you know, check marks around it and to, to, uh, to say that not, you know, we, we won't tolerate um, certain behaviors. So that's that. Um, this, you know, trying to apply the Leahy law, for example, is, is, a, is a particularly important uh, political kind of um, ask that we can do of politicians. So, sorry, I talked too long about that question. No, it was a good question and a good answer. Okay, um, this is more of a comment um, also from Wendy, who was, uh, and I echo this, it was a very powerful to listen to the poem um, about the activist while watching the video of her in action. And Wendy thinks, and I agree, that you should do that again Thank when you, you read the poem. Um, that, was, that, was, that was quite incredible. Um, that was the first time I, I did it. So I'm glad it worked. I wanted to take a chance. It's always important. It, to it's, I'm, I'm seeing thumbs up everywhere. <laughs> no, I thought that was a very powerful moment yeah. um, all the way around. Very so powerful moment. Thank you. And she, um, that uh, woman, uh, Hueda, not off. she is an attorney now and wor works in human rights and, and political advocacy. She's, um, you know, that, that moment, you know, she has kids and stuff, she can't go running around trying to block bullets. But it's, to me, it was such a powerful image of the, the, the courage and the risk that people are, are taking that we don't see, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so uh, I'll, all my hat off to her. And so, you know, when I see things like that, it, it reminds me that the small discomfort I have in, in engaging with my neighbors or in, in doing some political advocacy work is such a small discomfort compared to the, 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 the great vulnerability and precarity of so many people, of course, not only in Palestine, but, you know, in our own communities here, you know, thinking about Black Lives Matter and, um, indigenous people, indigenous women being murdered at astonishing rates and that sort of thing. I mean, we have so much work to do here as well. And so many places where we need to be doing it. Yeah. So I, I was think, thinking, yeah, sorry, go oh, ahead. Go. No, I was thinking when you were talking earlier about different, re and answering the question about different reactions to your work, um, Israelis, your Jewish neighbors, Palestinians, and that response, well, maybe this book isn't for me. Um, sometimes it's incredibly difficult when you've not been seen before to be seen. <laughs> um, and some people can't, some people can't bear that. It, it, it is itself a challenge to them to rethink what they have always thought about mm -hmm. the people who haven't seen them. Um, and that strikes me that that's part of the power of something like a story or a poem, is that it can elicit that involuntary almost recognition of someone who has resisted being recognized in order to be able to continue doing the work that they think that they have no other choice but to do. 
Yeah, thank you, Michelle. That 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 helps me kind of think about um, that response because my my initial uh, feeling is that maybe I've wronged them, you know, in some way. Um, and so I don't want to I don't want to take up space that can be uh, occupied by Palestinian voices or Israeli progressive voices on this issue, but I do want to open the, that door, and that's that's the attempt of this book. Um, and uh, so, so I just want to do a little shout out to some of my, uh, some of the people that I think you should read on this. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I can throw them in the chart, uh, the chat or whatever, but. Um, uh, oh, give us the shout out. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So Fatty, I mentioned Fatty Judah, whose uh, <laughs> name I can put in the chat. His uh, work, both his own poems and his translations of Mahmoud Darwish, the great Palestinian poet are amazing. Um, there is uh, there are so many kind of amazing um, writers uh, working right now. There's a young Palestinian uh, near me. He doesn't have a book out, but you can find some of her poems online. She represents a kind of uh, you know like a mid twenty year old perspective. Her name is Noor Hindi. Um, uh, let's see if I can think of some other poets off the top of my head. Uh, well, I certainly would hope that you look up Mosab Abu Toha, who um, is this Gaza uh, Palestinian who started the Edward Said uh, English Library in Gaza, um, the only English uh, language library in the country? And um, he's so uh, he's he's online. He's, he's done a number. I did an interview with him, which you can read. If you're interested in a, a wonderful Palestinian uh, female novelist, her name is Sahar Khalifa. Uh, she wrote two books that I love to teach. Uh, one is called Wild Thorns, translated as Wild Thorns. And there's a recent publication of one called Passage to the Plaza, which is a deeply feminist account of uh, what life under occupation looks like from a, a, a Palestinian woman's perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So those would be some names. I mean, there's great movies. Um, there's there's so much actually that uh, that's out there that that is easy to find, um, and that does um, just this incredible work of um, kind of sharing a lived experience that's beyond propaganda and that um, that doesn't demonize. Uh, and the same the same for there's some amazing Israeli writers. Um, there's a I'll just name a couple here. Uh, David Grossman is uh, a particularly powerful writer to me. Uh, I, I've taught a number of his books. Um, you know, everybody probably knows Yehuda Amichai. Um, mm -hmm. I have a poem sort of dedicated to him in the book. Uh, um, yeah, so those are, those are a couple. Of course, there are so many others, but uh, it gives you some names. It's a beautiful place to start. Yeah. Um, particularly, I appreciate the poets. Um, I'm kind of a poetry fanatic. Oh, good. My, well, my eldest child is a poet, and so um, in part, they say because they grew up in a house where I read poetry aloud to them from the time that they were a toddler. Um, but also, it, poetry is often, I think, an incredibly effective teaching tool. Yeah. In say, in the context of the course I teach on forgiveness. Um, yeah. There's one I'm going to be teaching for peace and justice studies in the spring about building communities mm -hmm. and building peace. And you've given me a number of really excellent ideas just from reading the manuscript that you shared with me, but also listening to you talk and tell your stories and read your poetry. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want to monopolize the conversation. So let me give a, 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 an encouragement for other questions if people want to ask them. Um, we still have some time. Um, it has just started raining incredibly hard here too. <laughs> I guess that Most means of, that the rain's about 15 minutes away for me then, right? Because it's well, rather than Probably, different. yeah. I have a question. I didn't catch everything. I admit that I came in late. But at the beginning kind of of this question answer section, you said something about not wanting to cross kind of a certain line when it came to being an activist in the classroom. And 
I'll admit to me that sounded really foreign. I've actually never really worried about um, being provocative in the classroom. And so that could either be a reflection of my privilege, it could be a reflection of the things I advocate for, a uh, reflection of my own naivety, or it could be actually something specific about the conflict, um, the politics that you're engaging with. And if that's the case, which that would be my best guess, I wanted to hear a little bit more about the fear or the concern or the challenge there and and if and if that's not what it is i still want to hear more okay. well um the wider context of pedagogy regarding the uh, palestinian and israeli issue is that um, there have been palestinians who not only have been um silenced but they've lost their jobs for teaching sort of uh explicitly kind of pro-palestinian work. And so um, people like Stephen Salada um, was offered a job, was given a job at the University of Illinois, it, you know, about, this was about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, he was uh, going to be in the um, sort of the Native American studies program there, but he does some interdisciplinary um, or comparative work with Native American and Palestinian um, narratives and experience. Um, he had tweeted out some uh, rather angry tweets during the guy, I think it was the God, must have been the Gaza War in 2014. And um, a huge sort of uh, powerful um, number of people kind of attacked him and, uh, and basically convinced the university to withdraw the offer. He had already um, resigned from his previous position at Virginia Tech and was not able to take this job. He ended up winning a court case, but I'm sure it wasn't for the uh, amount. And he's been essentially uh, black, blackballed from uh, the academy since. And this experience is not the only one. There's the famous, uh, you know, notorious example of uh, Norman Finkelstein at uh, DePaul, who was not given tenure. And, and in both cases, I think uh, um, the you know, well-known attorney, Alan Dershowitz, played a role in basically pressuring um, the universities to, to, to not hire or to not provide tenure. Um, and in my own university, I was, um, it, you know, there was a neighbor, I'd, I've never met this person, but they sort of asked me about the course and I told them a little bit about it. They, and I said, you know, if you're interested in coming to speak to my class, I'm open to, you know, um, input from others because I want the students to have a, a really wide range of understandings. She declined and said, uh, you know, Palestinians aren't a people, so I couldn't possibly come into this class. And I, you know, I said, you know, I can't then, okay, then I guess we're, we're done here or something. And then she emailed the president of my university saying I was preaching hatred toward the Jewish people. And um, so, and I didn't have tenure and I was in a very precarious position. Of course, thankfully, my university protected my, um, protected me because they saw, I showed them what I was doing and they said, he's doing what he says he's supposed to be doing. And um, so I feel like in some sense, um, my approach comes out of an experience of self-protectiveness, but also I wanna trust that my students, um, that I can give them the tools to, under, to, to make an assessment about how that they can get involved rather than telling them that it's, it's somehow part of their grade. Um, so the last assignment they do for my class is a special project in which they really take one of the, either the sticking point issues around um, a possible piece like status of Jerusalem, uh, the water rights and use, um, you know, uh, final borders, uh, the right of return or this, you know, what happens to refugees, um, 
all you know some of the major issues and uh, so so they get they have to do a lot of research and they they come to understand the 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 sort of conflict and its um, intricacies um, but I suppose like at the end of the day um, I suppose I think of the classroom as a space where you provide people with the tools to to um, to make their own decisions about what their responsibilities are and what how they want to engage in in issues and uh, and, and political change. Um, I, I'd be curious to know what what places or issues you're teaching and like do you have a, do you, do you think that that's do you think I'm being too shy about it or I'd be curious to know. Um. The, the, the specific Israel-Palestine conflict, I've heard lots of horror stories about the way the people who were involved are targeted. And that's not, that's probably the one issue that I never really go into because I feel like I don't have enough expertise to talk about that conflict. I have gotten the emails to the department chair, um, you know, stuff like that. Um, Sometimes from like the parents of students when I was in Georgia, like there was a lot of students who were living at home. And then I guess they would say like, we were talking about Black Lives Matter in class today. And then parents would not necessarily like that sometimes, but I don't, I don't want to judge you. I mean, I actually really actually sympathize for the, the fear of like you're pursuing tenure or you have tenure or whatever it might be. And if you say the wrong thing that the forces that might be uh, in, in disagreement um, are powerful. Uh, mm -hmm. And I know people who've gone to court over some of the stuff and even if they have the university protection, a two year legal battle ages them like 10 years in the process. And sometimes they succeed and feel like it wasn't worth the fight. So, um, but I, I didn't want to assume about you. And so, I mean, I completely understand the sensitivity. And I think that the idea of teaching the skills as opposed to the position is really a fantastic model. Um, and I may have misunderstood some about what I was hearing about not going there in the classroom. It sounds like you are going there at least to scratch the surface, even if it's not to tell students like where the atrocities are hidden. Well, they 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 do learn the the, the atrocity stuff, but the question is like, well, you know, I think you know, for example, the the one thing that will get you on the lists, the the the, the bad academic lists, mm -hmm. um, is to publicly advocate for um, the boycott sanction and divestment movement and uh you know i think that there are some reasons why people are deeply afraid of that uh of that movement um but that's the sort of thing that i say okay students like so what's the controversy here tell me what's going on there so so they have to do the work and thinking about the implications of what it would mean to support a movement like this and um what are its limits? Why are people afraid of it? Why, why do people think it's not fair? Why do some people think it's not fair? Um, so we do, we do kind of get into it. Um, but you're right, there's, I mean, you look it up, look up the Lawfare Project. And so there are, there are people who are um, ardent Jewish nationalists who, whose main job it is to, uh, you know, put legal suits together um, against academics who are you know, teaching and or activists even to sort of tie them up in exhausting court cases with, with no merit um, in, in which they get publicly accused of and therefore are seen as, um, you know, ter you know, like guilty as guilty before, you know, convicted. Um, do I talk with Jewish Voice for Peace? I see that question. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know, talk with them. I mean, uh, I don't, I've never given a talk for them. I, I, I get their emails and um, 
I'm interested in their work and I think that they're a, a brave organization. And um, I, 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 I have great sympathy and admiration for their, their work, which is trying to provide an, a Jewish alternative to a very strong block of, you know, um, we don't question and we always support our state. Well, I am mindful of the time. I think we have perhaps time for one more question before we let um, Phil go, give him a riotous round of virtual <laughs> applause. Um, so is there a last, uh, last comment or question or thought that someone would like to share? Well, I think I take silence for we are still mulling over. You've given sure. us a great deal to think about. Thank you. I want to thank you personally for a very rich uh, reading and conversation and sharing um, your work with us. And um, when someday my, my, my university allows me to invite outside lecturers into the classroom, your name is on my list. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, I I really appreciate uh, y your uh, facilitation here and the uh, introduction, but also everybody just like anybody who teaches this material, which is so, uh, you know, so difficult to, to navigate. And um, you show great uh, fortitude, great courage. And, um, and I think that that's, that, that gives me the most hope because silence doesn't serve, um, the, those who are silenced, you know what I mean? Like this, the general silence that has attended so much of this issue has only uh, perpetuated the, the, the injustice and the, the, the tragedy of this, so. I, I have seen people change. I mean, change dramatically. I had a very good friend who converted to um, modern Orthodox and moved to Israel and had been a progressive and stopped being a progressive. And we stopped being able to, we could talk about other things. We could not talk about this. And, you know, that's very sad. Um, so I, I applaud you for doing the work. I know how hard it is. Uh, and I really appreciate your willingness to share with us. We were very excited when we saw your proposal. Um, and this has been a great evening. For me, I've gone from the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense on Tuesday reparations on Wednesday, and then today, poetry and the four C's. And you remind me I need to reread John Paul Lederach's book uh, <laughs> about the moral imagination. So thank you, thank you very much. Um, I think you probably saw Michael's uh, message he had to leave, but he's looking forward to watching the whole video. And I'll remind everyone who's still here watching that if you are a member of PJSA, you can have access to the video recordings of all of our sessions from the virtual conference. There's a, this was just the first day of October. There is a lot more to come. And I look forward to seeing some of you at other sessions. Thank you. We'll let you go. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. You too.